video we are going to be switching topics a little bit and we're going to be talking about anesthesia monitoring specifically what do the numbers mean now anesthesia is a huge huge topic uh, it's very in-depth but this video is just going to be an introduction to anesthesia monitoring and vital parameters Unfortunately, as nurses, I think that we're often put into the position of monitoring anesthesia before we're fully versed about what we're doing. Because really, anesthesia is a very delicate balance of suppressing all of the mechanisms that are in place to keep your patient alive while trying not to kill them. And that sounds extreme, but anesthesia is extreme. It is not benign and is not something we should see as safe. There are ways to make anesthesia safer, but it will always carry inherent risks with it. And if you do anesthesia long enough, you will see anesthetic complications. And unfortunately, you will see anesthetic related deaths. It's the terrifying reality of what we're doing and we all need to know that going into it. So before we dive into different anesthetic vitals and monitoring parameters, I really wanna go over the anesthetic stages and planes because I think there's something that we're not initially taught before we start running anesthesia. So anesthesia is broken down into four different stages, one of which has four different planes. Stage one is induction. This is when our patients begin to be mildly sedate and start to lose their sense of awareness. Stage two is excitement. During this stage, our patients may have involuntary muscle movements and they may seem delirious or dysphoric. Stage two of anesthesia can make the patients difficult to hold as they squirm around. So this is often what we utilize our induction agent to try to push past quickly. Stage three of anesthesia is broken down into four different planes, and this is our surgical anesthetic stage. At this stage, we will begin to have a decrease in eye movements and a decrease in voluntary respirations. So stage three, plane one, includes decreased eyelid and conjunctival reflexes and a diminished swallowing or gag reflex. Our patients should begin to be intubatable at this plane. In plane two, we will have a diminished or total loss of the palpebral reflex. Plane three is considered true surgical anesthesia. We will have complete relaxation of the breathing muscles, including the intercostal muscles, and a loss of the pupillary light response. Plane three of anesthesia is our typical surgical plane. You may be able to maintain some patients in plane two for less painful anesthetic procedures, but for painful anesthetic procedures, plane three is considered our true surgical plane of anesthesia. Plane four is the beginnings of an overdose of anesthesia. Here we will have paralysis of the diaphragm, intermittent or total apnea, and a loss of our corneal reflex. Stage four is a true overdose of anesthesia. At this stage, patients will become apneic, they will have fixed and dilated pupils, and they will become hypotensive from their vasodilation. At this stage of anesthesia, death is imminent without intervention. So our goal when monitoring anesthesia is to keep our patients in the lightest plane possible while still maintaining a deep enough plane of anesthesia for the procedure to be accomplished. 
Now I want to talk a little bit about anesthetic agents. Most practices use gas anesthesia, specifically isoflurane, so that's what we'll be talking about mostly during this video. Isoflurane is a liquid anesthetic gas that is put into our vaporizer, which is then vaporized into an inhalant gas that is mixed with 100% oxygen to be delivered to our patient through the anesthetic circuit. To keep our patients in the appropriate plane of anesthesia, we will be increasing or decreasing our anesthetic gas percentage, our vaporizer percentage. To know what percentage we should be set setting our vaporizer at, we need to understand the concept of MAC. MAC stands for the minimum alveolar concentration, and this is a studied percentage at which 50% of patients will lose responses to painful stimuli. Surgical anesthesia is generally one to one and a half times MAC. So it's important to understand what MAC is of the anesthetic you're using in the type of patient that you're anesthetizing. For isoflurane, the MAC in dogs is studied to be around 1.3%, while in cats it's studied to be around 1.5%. And as with everything in my videos, references are going to vary slightly. But keep in mind that our MAC is affected by any other medications that we're using. So our pre-medications, our CRIs, if we're running any during anesthesia, all of that will affect our MAC. So patients that are being run on one or multiple different pre-medications or CRIs during anesthesia will have a reduced MAC. Despite that, very painful procedures will still need to be run at higher vaporizer settings. The important thing to remember is that anesthesia is going to be different for every patient, for every procedure. A young lab that's coming to your clinic for anesthesia for a TPLO is going to have a completely different anesthetic protocol than a geriatric lab that's coming in for a splenectomy for a bleeding abdominal mass. The young lab may need to be run at two, 3% on your vaporizer, whereas the old lab may need to be run on half to 1%. I've even run cases that the idea was to put them on the vaporizer and run them on isoflurane, but by the time we got into the OR, their fentanyl CRI was enough. Another knob you need to be paying attention to on your anesthetic machine is our oxygen flow meter. This is a knob that I feel most of us aren't taught much about. We're told to leave it on two liters per minute and either not come back to it or, or to adjust it with our vaporizer. So if we go up to 3%, put our oxygen up to three liters per minute. Really, that's not necessarily true. There are different methods of running anesthesia, but in general, when you're deter determining what to set your oxygen flow meter at, you really need to be aware of how fast you need to be running oxygen through the type of anesthetic circuit you're using. And also think about what that patient's oxygen demands are. In general, a safe estimate of oxygen consumption in the dog and cat is somewhere between four to seven mils per keg per minute. So we know we need to be above that to make sure we're delivering our patients adequate oxygen. But a lot of other things come into play. The resistance in our circuit, the type of circuit we're using, the type of anesthesia that we're running. So to begin to think about what we should be setting our oxygen flow meter at, we should look at what type of anesthetic circuit we're using. The two most common types of anesthetic circuits are going to be the non-rebreather and the rebreather. For a non-rebreather, oxygen flow rates are generally recommended to be between 200 and 500 mils per keg per minute at not less than one liter per minute. Whereas your rebreathing circuit, the recommended flow is around 30 mils per keg per minute at not less than half a liter per minute. Keep in mind for clinics with active scavenger systems, you may need to be running these gases at even higher rates. Higher flow rates are going to deliver your anesthetic gases faster. So keep in mind when you're turning up your oxygen flow rate, you are essentially also delivering anesthetic gases to your patient at a higher rate. So now that we know what our goals are for monitoring anesthesia, let's look at the tools that we use to determine what anesthetic plane we're in and whether our patient is too deep or too light. First, let's talk about heart rate. Your heart rate is typically monitored by two tools, your ECG and your pulse oximeter. Do you mind? 
Now the big question is what is an acceptable heart rate for your patient? Unfortunately, that is not as easy of a question to answer because just as with different sized patients and patients in different levels of fitness, they're going to have naturally different tolerable heart rates during anesthesia. I think in general, a good rule is if it's a heart rate you wouldn't find acceptable for a patient that's awake, it's probably not acceptable for a patient under anesthesia. Obviously, there are some exceptions to that rule, such as patients that are pre-medded with dexmedetomidine. They'll have lower tolerable heart rates. The reason we worry about heart rates under anesthesia is because in part, your heart rate helps determine your cardiac output which will determine your blood delivery and thus oxygen delivery to your patient's peripheral and tissues and core organs. In general, for large breed dogs, an acceptable heart rate will be somewhere between 50 to 140 beats per minute. In our small dogs, it'll be somewhere around 100 to 160, whereas in our cats, it'll be between 130 and 220. Tachycardia can be a sign that our patient is in too light of an anesthetic stage or plane, whereas bradycardia can be a sign that our patient is too deep. We can address tachycardia by increasing our patient's anesthetic depth by adding additional pain medications, or if it's tachycardia secondary to hypovolemia by trying to administer fluid bolus or colloids. Bradycardia can be addressed in kind of an opposite manner. So we can lighten our patient's anesthetic plane by reducing our anesthetic gas or anesthetic agent, or by decreasing any CRIs that we're running or potentially, depending on severity, reversing our patient's pain medications. So reversing our patient's opioids or if they were administered dexmedetomidine, reversing that. So next let's talk about respiratory rate. Respiratory rate is usually depressed from our anesthetic gases, our induction agents, any CRIs that we're running. But our patients that are under anesthesia are on nearly 100% oxygen. Normally, room air oxygen is only 20% oxygen, so in general they're receiving more air than they more oxygen than they would if they were awake. Thus, low respiratory rates are very tolerable in patients as long as they're oxygenating well. A normal respiratory rate for an anesthetized patient is usually between 10 and 20 breaths per minute. Although again, very fit patients or very large patients may have still inherently lower respiratory rates down to even five. And again, as long as our patient is respirating well and the rest of our vitals are normal, we can tolerate these low respiratory rates. Tachypnea or a very fast respiratory rate may be a sign of a patient that has too light of an anesthetic plane because they may be painful responding to the stimuli of the procedure. Ow! We do need to be very careful though that we are addressing the right issue when it comes to breathing pattern. I have heard of technicians increasing their anesthetic gases because they thought their patient was responding to a painful stimuli from surgery when really their patient was agonal and they increased the gases because they thought that they were acting painful. So if you're worried about your patient's respirations, it's very important to make sure you're addressing the correct issue. Patients that are hypoxemic will also attempt to increase their respiratory rate in an effort to make themselves oxygenate better. So it's also very important if you have a patient that has a low pulse oximeter reading that is becoming tachypnic that you address the correct issue, their hypoxemia, not put them into a deeper anesthetic plane because they're breathing so fast. A patient with heavily decreased respirations may be in too deep of an anesthetic plane. And in these scenarios, you will likely see an increased end tidal CO2 because our patient is hypoventilating. In these cases, we need to lighten our plane of anesthesia. In some scenarios, if you cannot do that because the patient is still reacted to painful stimuli, it may be beneficial to put your patient on the ventilator or to administer some extra pain medications so that we can lighten up on their anesthetic gases. The next vital to talk about is oxygen saturation or our pulse oximeter reading. For patients that are anesthetized and are on nearly 100% oxygen, our patients should have a pulse oximeter reading of 99 to 100%. 
Patients that have anything less than that during surgery is extremely abnormal and should be addressed quickly. That being said, as I have previously stated, the pulse oximeter is one of my least favorite diagnostic tools. It is an extremely finicky and often untrustworthy diagnostic tool. However, during anesthesia is when the pulse oximeter is working its best. So it is really important when we're monitoring anesthesia and we see a drop in our pulse ox to check our patient first. Again, I have seen people with decreased pulse oximetry readings try to address the issue with the probe and not look at the issue with their patient. And so yes, even though these probes are finicky and difficult and prone to error, it is most important to always look at your patient first. If you're concerned that your patient is genuinely not oxygen saturating appropriately, check everything about the patient before you start to worry about what your probe is doing. Make sure your patient is connected to the anesthetic circuit. Make sure oxygen is flowing. Check your flow meter. Make sure that ball is actually elevated. Check your reservoir bag. Make sure it's moving with the patient's breathing. Look at your flutter valves. Make sure those are moving. Check everything about your patient that you can. Ascult their lungs. Let's actually listen and make sure they have normal breath sounds. Look at their mucus, mucus membranes. Are they pink? Is the CRT normal? Once you have ruled out any problem with your patient, then you can try to rule out any problems with your probe. The probes do tend to read incorrectly in animals with dry tissue and after the probe has been in the same place for an extended period of time. They also tend to read incorrectly if they have had medications that can cause vasoconstriction. So things you can do to try to get your pulse ox to read more appropriately when it is a problem with the probe is put a wet gauze in between their tongue and the probe and make sure you move the probe around frequently throughout your anesthetic procedure. Another vital that we should be monitoring during anesthesia is temperature. Unfortunately, temperature is one of the most difficult vitals to control. Anesthesia inhibits all of the patient's bodily mechanisms that are in place to keep them in a normothermic state. Therefore, most patients become cold during an anesthetic procedure. The only things that we can really do for this is to try to provide them with as much heat support as we can. So using tools like hot dogs, bear huggers, warmies, fluid warmers, things like that. Doing your best to try to keep the patient warm is extremely important because a hypothermic patient will have a prolonged recovery and will be at an increased risk for an adverse event during the recovery period. So next, let's talk about blood pressure. It is extremely important for our blood pressure to be maintained in a normal range during anesthesia. The goal should be to keep our mean arterial blood pressure above 60. Like our other vitals, high blood pressure may mean too light of an anesthetic plane, while low pressure may mean too deep of an anesthetic plane. In addition, patients with severe systemic illnesses may have inherently low blood pressures going into surgery, making them even more difficult to try to maintain them in a normal or non-hypotensive range. One of the big questions that I see for technicians that are monitoring anesthesia is what do we do if our blood pressure is low? The first thing that you should do is try to lessen the amount of anesthetic agents that you are utilizing. So decrease your anesthetic gases, or if your patient is being run on a CRI, you can try to decrease that. If your patient is both hypotensive and responsive to surgical stimuli, this makes it really difficult because decreasing your anesthetic gases may not be a super good option for your patient. In scenarios like this, we can try to increase their pain control. So if they're being run on a fentanyl CRI, we can try to increase the CRI so that we can go down on their isoflurane. We can also consider adding other medications on board. Has it been a particularly long surgery and their pre-medications have worn off? Can we repeat a benzo dose? Can we add on ketamine or lidocaine CRI? 
for patients with low diastolic blood pressures or patients that have signs of hypovolemia, they may need one or multiple fluid boluses. We can try to start with a 5 to 10 mil per kg fluid bolus over 10 to 15 minutes or faster depending on how critical your patient is. Patients that are truly hypovolemic or in vasodilatory shock may require large numbers of fluid boluses. They also may respond better to colloid administration or vasopressor administration. Euvolemic patients may not require multiple fluid boluses and we should look at other causes for their hypotension to see if there's anything else we can address rather than just giving them a ton of fluids and potentially fluid overloading them. One of my favorite anesthetic monitoring tools and one that is not necessarily used in every practice is end tidal carbon dioxide monitoring or capnography. So your end tidal carbon dioxide is the amount of carbon dioxide that your patient is breathing out, the amount that they are expiring. A normal end tidal CO2 is 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. A low CO2 may be caused by hyperventilation, so patients that are breathing faster or expiring off more gas and that will inherently drive down their end tidal CO2. Patients that have high end tidal CO2s may be hypoventilating, so not breathing enough. And this may be from a too deep of an anesthetic plane. Your capnograph will also give you an actual graph on your anesthetic machine that will show you the different phases of their breathing cycle. So their inspiratory and their expiratory phases. This graph can be extremely helpful, but interpreting it is a little bit beyond the scope of this video. However, we will go into depth about it at some point because keeping an eye on this graph can be one of the first signs of an impending cardiac respiratory arrest in your patient. And then another extremely helpful anesthetic monitoring tool is our ECG. So our ECG will tell you not only your patient's heart rate, but your patient's heart rhythm. A heart rhythm is extremely important to monitor during anesthesia, but interpreting an ECG is also a little bit beyond the scope of this video. I do plan on having at least one or probably several videos dedicated to ECG interpretation, but it is at least important for you to know the normal parts of an ECG, your P wave, your QRS complex, and your T wave. If you're at least familiar with these different parts of the wave, you'll be able to tell when something is wrong, even if you don't know exactly what is wrong or what it means. Thanks for sticking it out with me, even though this was kind of a long video. If you have made it this far, as always, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, leave a comment in the comment section if you have any particular topic you want to go over, and I will see you guys next time. You're so funny. Come here. What in the world? No, these aren't your temptations. You can't tap them. If you are con- Wait, 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 wait. Okay, they are yours. You can have some, but later. You just had a bunch. Don't rub on that. <laughs> Polly, come here. Don't rub on that. Come on. Oh. <laughs>